Chapter 32 Alibi 1969 Low, dark clouds raced over a steel sea toward Barclay Cove. The wind hit first, rattling windows and hurling waves over the wharf. Boats tied to the dock bobbed up and down like toys, as men in yellow slickers tied this line or that, securing. Then sideways rain slammed the village, obscuring everything except the old yellow form moving about in the greyness. The wind whistled through the sheriff's window, and he raised his voice. So, Joe, you had something to tell me. Sure do. I found out where Miss Clark will claim she was the night Chase died. What? Did you finally catch up with her? You're kidding. She's slipperier than a damn eel. Gets gone every time I get near. So I drove over to Jumpin's Marina this morning to see if he knew where she'd be coming in next. Like everybody else has to go there for gas, so I figured I'd catch up with her sooner or later. You won't believe what I found out. Let's have it. I got two reliable sources, so she was out of town that night. What? Who? She never goes out of town. And even if she did, who'd know about it? You remember Tate Walker? Dr. Walker now. Works out at the new ecology lab. Yeah, I know him. His dad's a shrimper. Scupper Walker. Well, Tate says he knew Kaya. He calls her Kaya. Quite well, when they were younger. Oh. Not like that. They were just kids. He taught her to read, apparently. He'd tell you this himself? Yep. He was there at Jumpin's. I was asking Jumpin' if he knew where or how I could get ask the Marsh girl some questions. He said he didn't know for one minute to next when she when he'd see her. Jumpin's always been good to her. Doubt if he'll tell us much. Well, I asked him if by any chance he knew what she was doing the night Chase died. He said that it wasn't a matter of fact he did. That she'd come to his place the second morning after Chase died and that he was the very one who had told her he was dead. He said she'd been in Greenville for two nights, including the night Chase died. Greenville? That's what she said. And then Tate, who'd been standing there all that time, he piped in and said, yeah, she'd been in Greenville, and that he was the one who told her how to buy the bus ticket. Well, that is some news, Sheriff Jackson said, and very convenient that they were both standing there with the same story. Why would she go over to Greenville? Tate said that a publishing company, you know, she's gone and written a book on shells and one of a seabird and one of seabirds. Well, they paid her expenses to go over there and meet him. Hard to imagine fancy publishing people wanting to meet her. I guess it'll be pretty easy to check out. What did Tate say about teaching her to read? I asked him how he knew her. He said he used to go out near her place to fish, and when he found out she couldn't read, he taught her. Hmm. That's so. Joe said, Anyway, this changes things. She does have an alibi. A good one. I'd say being in Greenville's a pretty good alibi. Yeah, on the surface. You know what they say about good alibis. And we got that shrimper saying he saw her boating directly toward the fire tower the very night Chase fell off it. He could have been wrong. It was dark. No moon until after 2am. Maybe she was in Greenville and he saw somebody else out there in a boat that looks like hers. Well, like I said, this supposed trip to Greenville should be easy to check out. The storm abated into a whine and drizzle. Still, instead of walking to the diner, the two lawmen sent, out a, sent a runner for takeout of chicken and dumplings, butter beans, summer squash casserole, cane syrup and biscuits. Right after lunch, a knock, surrounded, a knock sounded on the sheriff's door. Miss Pansy Price opened it and stepped inside. Joe and Ed stood, her turban hat glistening a rose colour. Afternoon, Miss Pansy. Both nodded. Good afternoon, Ed. Joe, may I have a seat? I won't take long. I believe I have important information concerning this case. Yes, of course. Sit down. The two men sat as soon as Miss Pansy settled like a fair-sized hen into the chair, tucking feathers here and there, her pocketbook perching on her lap like a prized egg. The sheriff, continuing, couldn't resist. And what case would that be, Miss Pansy? 
Oh, for heaven's sake, Ed, you know what case. Who murdered Chase Andrews? That case. We don't know if he was murdered, Miss Pansy, all right? Now what do you have for us? As you know, I'm employed at Cresses. She never lowered her standing by referring to the entire name. Cresses Five and Dime. She waited for the sheriff to acknowledge her comment with a nod, even though they all knew she'd worked there since she sold toy soldiers to him as a boy, and then continued. I believe the Marsh girl is a suspect. Is that correct? Who told you that? Oh, lots of people are convinced, but Paddy loves the main source. I see. Well, from Cresses, me and some of the other employees saw the Marsh girl get on and off the bus on days that would have put her out of town the night Chase died. I can testify to those dates and times. That's so, Joe and Ed exchanged glances. What are the dates and times? Miss Pansy sat straight in her chair. She left at 2.30pm, bus on October 28th, and returned at 1.16 on the 30th. You saw. You said others saw too. Yes, I can get a list if you like. That won't be necessary. We'll come over to the five and dime if we want statements. Thank you, Miss Pansy. The sheriff stood, and Miss Pansy and Ed did as well. She moved toward the door. Well, thank you for your time. As you said, you know where to find me. They said goodbyes. Joe sat back down. Well... There it is. Confirms that Tate and Jumpin' said she was in Greenville that night. Or at least she got on the bus and went somewhere. The sheriff blew out a long breath. Appears so. But I reckon if somebody can bus over to Greenville by day, they can bus back here at night. Do their business. Bus back to Greenville. Nobody the wiser. Well, I guess. Seems a bit of a stretch. Go get the bus schedules. We'll see if the times work out if a return trip is possible in one night. Before Joe stepped out, Ed continued. Could be she wanted to be seen out there in broad daylight getting on and off those buses. When you think about it, she had to do something out of the ordinary for an alibi, to claim that she had been alone in her shack the night Chase died, as she usually is, would not be an al alibi at all. Zip. So she planned up something that lots of people would see her do making a great alibi right in front of all those folks on Main Street. Brilliant. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Anyhow, we don't have to play gumshoe anymore. We can sit right here drinking coffee and let the ladies of the town waltz in and out of here with all the goods. I'll go get the bus schedules. Joe returned 15 minutes later. Well, you're right, he said. See here? It would be possible to get the bus from Greenville to Barclay Cove and then back again all in one night. Easy, really. Yeah. Plenty of time for plenty of time between the two buses to push somebody off the fire tower. I say we get a warrant. Chapter thirty three The Scar nineteen sixty eight In the winter of nineteen sixty eight, Kaya sat at her kitchen table one morning sweeping orange and pink watercolours across paper, creating the plump form of a mushroom. She had finished her book on seabirds and now worked on a guide to mushrooms, already had plans for another on butterflies and moths. Black-eyed peas, red onions and salt ham boiled in the old dented pot on the wood stove, which she still preferred to the new range, especially in winter. The tin roof sang under a light rain, then, suddenly, the sound of a truck labouring through sand came down her lane. Rumbling louder than the roof, panic rising, she stepped to the window and saw a red pickup manoeuvring the muddy ruts. Kaya's first thought was to run, but the truck was already pulling up to the porch. Hunched down below the window sill, she watched a man in a grey-green military uniform step out. He just stood there. Truck door ajar, looking through the woods, down the path toward the lagoon. Then, closing the door softly, he jogged through the rain to the porch door and knocked. She cussed. He was probably lost, would ask directions and go on. But she didn't want to deal with him. She could hide here in the kitchen and hope he went away. But she heard him call. 
Yo, anybody home? Hello? Annoyed yet curious, she walked through the newly furnished sitting room to the porch. The stranger, tall with dark hair, stood on the front step holding the screen door open, five feet from her. His uniform seemed stiff to stand on its own, as if it were holding him together. The breast of his jacket was coloured was covered with colourful rectangular metals. But most eye catching of all was the jagged red scar that cut his face in half from his left ear to the top of his lips. Kaya gasped. In an instant she returned to the Easter Sunday about six months before Ma left for good, singing Rock of Ages, she and Ma walked arm in arm through the sitting room to the kitchen and gathered up the brilliantly coloured eggs. They had painted the night before. The other kids were out fishing, so she and Ma had time to hide the eggs, then get the chicken and biscuits into the oven. The brothers and sisters were too old to hunt for treats, but they would run around searching, pretending not to find them, then holding each other, then holding each discovered treasure high in the air and laughing. Ma and Kaya were leaving the kitchen with the with their baskets of eggs and chocolate bunnies from the five and dime just as Pa rounded the corner from the hall. Yanking Kaya's Easter bonnet from her head and waving it around, he screamed at Ma. Where you get the money for all these fancy things? Bonnets and shiny leather shoes, then prissy eggs and chick and chocolate bunnies? Where? Come on, Jake, please hush. It's Easter. This is for the kids. He shoved Ma backwards. You're whoring, that's what. That's how you get money? Tell me now. He grabbed Ma by the arms and shook her so hard her face seemed to rattle around her eyes, which stayed very still and wide. Eggs tumbled from the basket and rolled in wobbly pastels across the floor. Pa, please stop, Kaya cried out, then sobbed. He lifted his hand and slapped Kaya hard across the cheek. Shut up, you pissy pot crybaby. Get that silly looking dress and those fancy shoes off. Them's whoring clothes. She ducked down, grabbing her face, chasing after Ma's hand-painted eggs. I'm telling you, woman, where you get your money? He lifted the iron fire poker from the corner and moved toward Ma. Kaya screamed as loud as she could and grabbed at Pa's arms as he slammed the poker across Ma's chest. Blood popped out of the flowery sundress like red polka dots. Then a big body moved down the hall, and Kaya looked up, to see Jody tackle Pa from behind, sending them both sprawling across the floor. Her brother got between Ma and Pa and hollered for Kaya and Ma to run, and they did. But before she turned, Kaya saw Pa raise the poker, poker and whack Jody across the face, his jaw twisting grossly, blood spewing. The scene played out in her mind now in a flash, her brother crumbling onto the floor, lying among purple-pink eggs and chocolate bunnies. She and Ma running through palmettos, hiding in the bush. Her dress bloody. Ma kept saying it was fine. The eggs wouldn't break, and they could still cook the chicken. Kaya didn't understand why they stayed hidden there. She was sure her brother was dying, needed their help, but she was too afraid to move. They waited for a long time, and then snuck back, looking through the windows to make sure Pa was gone. Jody lay cold on the floor, blood pulled around him, and Kaya cried that he was dead. But Ma roused him and moved him to the sofa, where she sti stitched up his face with her sewing needle. When all was quiet, Kaya snatched her bonnet from the floor and ran fast through the woods and threw it with all her might into the saw grass. Now she looked into the eyes of a stranger standing on her porch and said, Jody. He smiled, the scar going crooked, and replied, Kaya, I'd hoped you'd be here. They stared, each searching for the other in older eyes. Jody couldn't know. Jody couldn't know he had been with her all these years, that scores of times he had shown her the way through the marsh, taught her over and over about herons and fireflies. More than anyone else, she had wanted to see Jody or Ma again. Her heart had erased the scar and all the pain in that package. No wonder her mind buried the scene. No wonder Ma had left. 
hit by a poker across the chest, Kaya saw those rubbed-out stains on the flowered sundress as blood again. He wanted to hug her, fold her into his arms, but as he moved toward her she hung her head low and to the side in profound shyness and backed up, so he simply stepped onto the porch. Come in, she said, and led him into the small living room chock full with her specimens. Oh, he said, yes, then I saw your book, Kaya. I didn't know for sure if it was you, but yes, now I can see it was. It's amazing. He walked around looking at her collections, also examining the room with its new furniture, glancing down the halls to the bedrooms, not wanting to snoop, but taking it all in. Do you want coffee or tea? She didn't know if he'd come to visit or to stay. What did he want after all these years? Coffee would be great. Thank you. In the kitchen, he recognised the old wood stove next to the new gas range and refrigerator. He ran his hand over the old kitchen table, which she had kept as it was, with all its peeling paint history. She poured the coffee in mugs and they sat. You're a soldier, then? Two tours in Nam. I'm staying in the army for a few more months. They've been good to me. Paid for my college degree, mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. Least I can do is stay a while. Georgia wasn't all that far away. He could have visited sooner. But he was here now. You all left, she said. Pa stayed a while after you, but then he went too. I didn't know where. I don't know if he's alive or not. You've been here by yourself since then? Yes. Kaya, I shouldn't have left you with that monster. I've ached. I felt terrible about it for years. I was a coward. A stupid coward. These damn medals don't mean a thing. He swiped at his chest. I left you. A little girl. Alone. To survive in a swamp with a madman. I don't expect you to forgive me ever. Jody, it's okay. You were just a kid yourself. What could you do? I could have come back when I was older. At first it was day-to-day -day survival on the streets back of in the back streets of Atlanta. He sneered. I left here with 75 cents in my pocket, stole it from the money Pa left in the kitchen, took it knowing it would leave you short. I scraped by on an odd jobs until the army took me in. After training, it was straight to war. When I got home, so much time had passed I figured you were long gone. Run away yourself. That's the reason I didn't write. I think I signed up to go back as a kind of self-punishment. What I deserved for leaving you. Then, I graduated from tech a couple months ago. I saw your book in the shop. Catherine Danielle Clark. My heart just broke and leapt for joy all at once. I had to find you. Figured I'd start here and track you down. Well, here we are then. She smiled for the first time. His eyes were the same as they had been. Faces changed with life's toll, but eyes remain a window to what was and she could see him there. Jody, I'm so sorry you worried about leaving me. Not once did I blame you. We were, we were the victims, not the guilty. He smiled. Thank you, Kaya. Tears welled, and they both looked away. She hesitated, then said, This may be hard to believe, but for a while Pa was good to me. He drank less, taught me to fish, we went out in the boat a lot, all over the marsh, but then he went back to drinking and left me to fend for myself. Jody nodded. Yeah, I saw that side of him a few times, but he always went back to the bottle. He told me once it had something to do with the war. I've been to war myself and seen things that could drive a man to drink, but he shouldn't have taken out on his wife and his own kids. What about Ma and the others? she asked. Did you ever hear from them? Do you know where they went? I don't know a thing about Murph, Mandy or Missy. I wouldn't know them if I passed them in the street. By now I suppose they've scattered with the wind. But Ma? Well, Kaya, there's another reason I wanted to find you. There is some news of her. Some news? 
What? Tell me. Chills flowed through Kaya's arms to her fingertips. Kaya, it's not good. I only found out last week. Ma died two years ago. She bent at the waist, holding her face in her hands. Soft groans came from her throat. Jody tried to hold her, but she moved away from him. Jody continued. Ma had a sister, Rosemary, who tried to track us down through the Red Cross when Ma died, but they couldn't find us. Then a couple months ago they found me through the army and put me in touch with Rosemary. In hoarse tones, Kaya mumbled. Ma was alive until two years ago. I've been waiting all these years for her to walk down the lane. She stood and held the sink. Why didn't she come back? Why didn't somebody tell me where she was? And now it's too late. Jody went to her, and even though she tried to turn away, he put his arms around her. I'm sorry, Kaya. Come sit down. I'll tell you what Rosemary said. He waited for her, then said, Ma was ill from a major breakdown when she left us and went to New Orleans. That's where she grew up. She was mentally and physically ill. I remember New Orleans a little bit. I guess I was five when we left. All I remember is a nice big house, windows overlooking a garden. But once we moved here, Pa wouldn't let any of us talk about New Orleans or our grandparents or any of it. So it's all wiped away. Kaya nodded. I never knew. Jody continued. Rosemary said their parents had been against Ma's par- marriage to Pa from the start, but Ma went off to North Carolina with her husband, not a penny to their names. Eventually, Ma began to write to Rosemary and told her of her circumstances, living in a swamp shack with a drunk man who beat her and her children. Then one day, years later, Ma showed up. She had on those fake alligator heels that she cherished, hadn't bathed or combed her hair in days. For months, Ma was mute, didn't speak one word. She stayed in her old room at her parents' home, barely eating. Of course, they had doctors come out, but no one could help her. Ma's father contacted the sheriff in Barkley Cove to ask if Ma's children were all right, but his office said that they didn't try to keep track of the Marsh people. Kaya sniffed now and then. Finally, almost a year later, Ma became hysterical and told Rosemary she remembered she had left her children. Rosemary helped her write a letter to Pa, asking if she could come get us and bring us to live with her in New Orleans. He wrote back that if she returned or contacted us in any way, he would beat us unrecognisable. She knew he was capable of such a thing. The letter in the blue envelope. Ma had asked for her. For all of them. Ma had wanted to see her, but the outcome of the letter had been vastly different. The words had enraged Pa and sent him back to drinking, and then Kaya had lost him as well. She didn't mention to Jody that she still kept the ashes, the letter's ashes, in a little jar. Rosemary said Ma never made friends, never dined with the family or interacted with anybody. She allowed herself no life, no pleasure. After a while, she started talking more, and all she talked about was her children. Rosemary said Ma loved loved us all her life, but was frozen in some horrible place of believing that we'd be harmed if she returned, and abandoned if she didn't. She didn't leave us to have a fling. She'd been driven to madness and barely knew she'd left. Kaya asked, How did she die? She had leukaemia. Rosemary said it was possibly treatable, but Ma refused all medication. She just became weaker and weaker and slipped away two years ago. Rosemary said she died much as she had lived, in darkness and silence. Jody and Kaya sat still. Kaya thought of the poem by Galway Kinnell that Ma had underlined in her book. I have to say I'm relieved it is over. At the, end of, at the end, I could feel only pity for that urge toward more life. Goodbye. Jody stood. Come with me, Kaya. I want to show you something. He led her outside to his pickup, and they climbed into the back. 
Carefully, he removed a tarp and opened a large cardboard box, and one by one pulled out unwrapped oil paintings. He stood them up around the bed of the truck. One was of three young girls, Kaya and her sister, sitting, sisters, sitting by the lagoon, watching dragonflies. Another of Jody and their brother holding up a string of fish. I brought them in case you were still here. Rosemary sent these to me. She said that for years, day and night, Ma painted us. One painting showed all five children as if they were watching the artist. Kaya stared into the eyes of her sisters and brothers looking back at her. In a whisper she said, Who's who? What? There were never any photographs. I don't know them. Who's who? Oh. He couldn't breathe and finally said, Well, this is Missy, the oldest, then Murph, Mandy, and of course this little cutie is me, and that's you. He gave her time, then said, Look at this one. Before him was an astonishingly colourful oil of of two children squatting in swirls of green grass and wildflowers. The girl was only a toddler, perhaps three years old, her straight black hair falling over her shoulders. The boy, a bit older, with golden curls, pointed to a monarch butterfly, its black and yellow wings spread across a daisy. His hand was on the girl's arm. I think that's Tate Walker, Jody said. And you? I think you're right. It looks like him. Why would Ma pa- Why would Ma paint Tate? He used to come around quite a bit, fish with me. He was always showing you insects and stuff. Why don't I remember that? You were very young. One afternoon, Tate boated into our lagoon where Pa was pulling out his poke really drunk. You were waiting and Pa, and Pa was supposed to be watching you. Suddenly, for no reason at all, Pa grabbed you by your arms and shook you so hard your head was thrown back. Then he dropped you in the mud and started laughing. Tate jumped out of the boat and ran up to you. He was only seven or eight at the time, but he shouted at Pa. Of course, Pa smacked him and screamed at him to get off his land. Never come back or he'd shoot him. By this time, we'd all run down to see what was happening. Even with Pa ranting and raving, Tate picked you up and handed you to Ma. He made sure you were all right before he left. We still went fishing some after that, but he never came back around our place again. Not until he led me home that first time I took the boat out in the marsh, Kaya thought. She looked at the painting. So pastel. So peaceful. Somehow Ma's mind had pulled beauty from lunacy. Anyone looking at these portraits would think they portrayed the happiest of families, living on a seashore, playing in sunshine. Jody and Kaya sat on the rim of the truck bed, still looking quietly at the paintings. He continued. Ma was isolated and alone. Under the circumstances, people behaved differently. Kaya made a soft groan. Please don't talk to me about isolation. No one has to tell me how it changes a person. I've lived it. I am isolation. Kaya whispered with a light edge. I forgive Ma for leaving, but I don't understand why she didn't come back, why she abandoned me. You probably don't remember, but after she walked away, you told me that a she-fox will sometimes leave her kits if she's starving or under other extreme stress. The kits die, as they probably would have anyway. But the vixen lives to breed again when the conditions are better, when she can raise a new litter to maturity. I've read a lot about this since. In nature, out yonder, where the crawdads sing, these ruthless seeming behaviours actually increase the mother's number of young over her lifetime, and thus her genes for abandoning offspring in times of stress are passed on to the next generation. And on and on. It happens in humans too. Some behaviours that seem harsh to us now ensure the, uh, ensure the survival of early man in whatever swamp he was in at the time. Without them, we wouldn't be here. 
we will store these instincts in our genes, and they express themselves when certain circumstances prevail. Some parts of us will always be what we were, what we had to be to survive. Way back yonder. Maybe some primitive urge, some ancient genes, not not appropriate anymore, drove Ma to leave us because of the stress, the horror and the real danger of living with Pa. That doesn't make it right. She should have chosen to stay. But knowing that these tendencies are in our biological blueprints make, might help one forgive even a failed mother. That may explain her leaving, but I still don't see why she didn't come back. Why she didn't even write me. She could have written a letter after... She could have written letter after letter, year after year, until one finally got to me. I guess some things can't be explained. Only forgiven or not. I don't know the answer. Maybe there isn't one. I'm sorry to bring you this bad news. I've had no family. No news of family for most of my life. Now, within a few minutes, I've found my brother and lost my mother. I'm so sorry, Kaya. Don't be. Actually, I lost Ma years ago. And now you're back, Jody. I can't tell you how much I wanted to see you again. This is one of the happiest and yet saddest days of my life. She touched his arm with her fingers, and he already knew her enough to know that this was rare. They walked back to the shack and looked around at, this, at the new things, the freshly painted walls, the handcrafted kitchen cabinets. How did you manage, Kaya? Before your book, how did you get money and food? Oh, well that's a long, boring story. Mostly I sold mussels, oysters and smoked fish to jump in. Jody threw his head back and laughed out loud. Jumpin'? I haven't thought about him for years. Is he still around? Kaya didn't laugh. Jumpin' has been my best friend. For years my only friend. My only family unless you count herring gulls. Jody turned serious. Didn't you have friends in school? I only went to school one day in my life, she chuckled. The kids laughed at me so I never went back. Spent weeks outsmarting the truant officers, which, after all the things you'd taught me, wasn't very hard. He looked astonished. How did you learn to read? To write your book? Actually, it was Tate Walker who taught me how to read. You ever see him any more? Now and then, she stood, faced the stove. More coffee? Jodie felt the lonely life hanging in her kitchen. It was there in the tiny supply of onions and the vegetable baskets, the single plate drying on the rack, the cornbread wrapped carefully in a tiny tea towel, the way an old widow might do it. I've had plenty, thanks. But what about a ride around the marsh? He asked. Of course. You won't believe it. I have a new motor, but I still use the same old boat. The sun had broken up the clouds and shone bright and warm for a winter day. As she, stared, as she steered them through the narrow channels and glassy estuaries, he exclaimed at a remembered snag, the same as it had been, and a beaver lodge still piled in the exact spot. They laughed when they came to the lagoon where Ma, Kaya and their sisters had grounded the boat in mud. Back at the shack, she put together a picnic which they ate on the beach with the gulls. I was so young when they all left, she said. Tell me about the others. So he told her stories of their older brother Murph, who carried her around on his shoulders through the woods. He used to laugh the whole time. He would jog and turn in circles with you way up there, and one time you laughed so hard you wet your pants right on his neck. Oh no, I didn't, Kaya leaned back laughing. Yeah, you did. He squealed some, but he kept on going, ran right into the, the lagoon until he was underwater, you still riding on his shoulders. We were all watching, Ma, Missy, Mandy and me, and laughed till we cried. Ma had to sit right down on the ground, she was laughing so hard. Her mind invented pictures to go with the stories, 
family scraps and shreds Kaya never thought she'd have. Jodie continued. It was Missy who started feeding the gulls. What? Really? I thought I started on my own. After everybody left. No, she fed the gulls every day. She could get away with it. She gave them all names. She called one big red, I remember that. You know, after the red spot on their bills. It's not the same bird, of course. I've gone through a few generations of big reds myself. But they're the one on the left. That's big red today. She tried to connect with her sister, who had given her the gulls, but all she could see was the face in the painting, which was more than she had before. The red spot on the herring gull's bill, Kaya knew, was more than decoration. Only when the chicks pecked out at the spot of their bills would their parent release the captured food for them. If the red spot was obscured so the chick couldn't tap it, the parent wouldn't feed them and they would die. Even in mature parenthood, even in nature, parenthood is a thinner line than one might think. They sat for a moment, then Kaya said, I just don't remember much at all. You're lucky then. Keep it that way. They sat there, they sat like that quietly, not remembering. She cooked a southern supper as Ma would have. Black-eyed peas with red onions, fried ham, cornbread with crackling, butter beans cooked in the in butter and milk, blackberry cobbler with hard cream with some bourbon Jody bought. As they ate, he told her he would like to stay a few days, if that was okay, and she said he was welcome as long as he liked. This is your land now, Kaya. You earned it. I'm stationed at Fort Benning for a while, so I can't stay long. After that, I'll probably get a job in Atlanta so we can stay in touch. I'd like to see you as often as I can get up here. Knowing you're okay is all I ever wanted in my life. I'd like that, Jody. Please come whenever you can. The next evening, as they sat on the beach, wave tips tickling their bare toes, Kaya chatted in unusual fashion, and Tate seemed to be in every paragraph. There was a time he showed her the way home when she was a little girl, lost in the marsh, or the first poem Tate read to her. She talked about the feather game and how he taught her to read, how he was a scientist at the lab now. He was, the first, he was her first love, but he dropped her when he went to college, left her waiting on the lagoon shore, so it had ended. How long ago was that? Jodie asked. About seven years, I guess, when he first went to Chapel Hill. Did you ever see him again? He came back to apologise. Said he still loved me. He was the one who suggested I publish reference books. It's nice to see him now and then in the marsh, but I'd never get involved again. He can't be trusted. Kaya, that was seven years ago. He was just a boy. First time away from home, hundreds of pretty girls around. If he came back and apologised and said he loves you, maybe you should cut him a little slack. Most men go from one female to the next. The unworthy ones strut about, pulling you in with falsehoods, which is probably why Ma fell for a man like Pa. Tate wasn't the only guy who left me. Chase Andrews even talked to me about marriage, but he married someone else. Didn't even tell me. I read about it in the paper. I'm so sorry, Kaya. I am. But it's not just guys who are unfaithful. I've been duped, dropped, run over a few times myself. Let's face it, a lot of the time love doesn't work out. Yet, even when it fails, it connects you to others. And in the end, that's all you have. The connections. Look at us. You and I have each other now, and just think. If I have kids and you have kids, well, that's a whole new string of connections. And on it goes. Kaya, if you love Tate, take a chance. Kaya thought of Ma's painting of Tate and herself as children their heads close together, surrounded by pastel flowers and butterflies. Maybe a message from Ma after all. On the third morning of Jodie's visit, they unpacked Ma's paintings, all but one which Jodie kept, and hung on some of the walls. 
the shack took on a different light, as though more windows had opened up. She stood back and stared at them, a miracle to have some of Ma's paintings back on the walls, pulled from the fire. Then Kaya walked out to his then Kaya walked Jody out to his pickup and gave him a bag lunch she'd made for the trip. They both looked in through the trees, down the lane, everywhere except into each other's eyes. Finally, he said, I better get going, but here's my address and phone number, as he held out a scrap of notepaper. She stopped breathing, and with her left hand, she held herself steady on the truck as she took the paper with her right. Such a simple thing, the address of a brother on a slip of paper. Such an astonishing thing, a family she could find, a number she could call and he would answer. She choked on her own throat as he pulled her into him, and finally, after a lifetime, she sagged against him and wept. I never thought I'd see you again. I thought you were gone forever. I'll always be here, I promise. Whenever I move, I'll send a new address. If you ever need me, you write or you call, you hear? I will, and come back and visit whenever you can. Kaya, go find Tate. He's a good man. He waved her from the truck window all the way down the lane as she watched, crying and laughing all at once. And when he turned onto the track, she could see his red pickup through the holes of the forest where a white scarf had once trailed away, his long arm waving until he was gone. Chapter 34 Search the Shack 1969 well, again she's not here, Joe said, knocking on the frame of Kaya's screen door. Ed stood on the brick and board steps, cupping his hands to the mesh to see inside. Enormous limbs of the oak hung with long strands of Spanish moss, cast shadows on the weather boards, on the weathered boards and pointy roof of the shack. Only grey patches of sky blinked through the late November morning. Of course she's not here. It doesn't matter. We have a search warrant. Just go in. I bet it's not locked. Joe opened the door, calling out. Anybody home? Sheriff here. Inside, they stared at the shelves of her menagerie. Ed, look at all this stuff. It just keeps going. In the next room yonder and down the hall. Looks like she's a bit off her rocker. Crazy as a three-eyed rat. Maybe, but apparently she's quite the expert on the marsh. You know she published those books. Let's get busy. Okay, here's things to look for. The sheriff read out a list from uh, read out from a short list. Articles of red wool clothing that might match the fibers found on Chase's jacket. A diary, calendar or notes, something that might mention places or times of her whereabouts. The shell necklace or stubs from those night buses. And let's not mess up her stuff. No reason to do that. We can look under, around everything. Don't need to ruin any of this. Yeah, I hear ya. Almost like a shrine in here. Half of me's impressed. The other half's got the heebie-jeebies. It's going to be tedious, that's for sure, the sheriff said as he carefully looked behind a row of birds' nests. I'll start back in her bedroom. The men worked silently pushing clothes into drawers, poking in cl closet corners, shifting jars of snake skins and shark teeth in search of evidence. After ten minutes, Joe called, Come look at this. As Ed entered the porch, Joe said, Did you know that female birds have only got one ovary? What are you talking about? See, these drawings and notes show that female birds only got one ovary. Dang it, Joe, we're not here for a biology lesson. Get back to work. Wait a second. Look here. This is a male peacock feather, and the note says that over eons of time, the male feathers got larger and larger to attract females, to the point the males can barely get off the ground. Can hardly fly anymore. Are you finished? We have a job to do. Well, it's very interesting. Ed walked from the room. Get to work, man. Ten minutes later, Joe called out again. 
As Ed walked out of the small bedroom toward the sitting room, he said, Let me guess, you found a mouse stuffed with three eyes. There was no reply, but when Ed walked into the room, Joe held up a red wool hat. Where did you find that? Right here, hanging on this row of hooks with these coats, other hats and stuff. In the open like that. Right here, like I said. From his pocket, Ed pulled out, Ed pulled out a plastic bag containing the red fibres from Chase's denim jacket the night he died and held it against the red hat. They look exactly the same. Same colour, same size and thickness. Joe said as both men studied the hat and sample. They do. Both of them that fuzzy beige wool mixed in with the red. Man, this could be it. We'll have to send that hat to the lab, of course. But if these fibres match, we'll bring her in for questioning. Bag and label the hat. After hours of searching, the men met in the kitchen. Stretching his back, Ed said, I reckon if there's anything else we could have found, it, we would have found it by now. We can always come back, call it a day. Maneuvering the ruts back to town, Joe said, Seems like if she's guilty of this thing, she would have hidden the red cap, not just hung it out in the open like that. She probably had no idea fibres would fall off the hat onto his jacket, or that the lab could identify them. She just wouldn't know something like that. Well, she might not have known that, but I bet she knows a bunch. Those male peacocks strutting around, competing so much for sex they can hardly fly. I ain't sure what it all means, but it all adds up to something. Chapter 35 The Compass 1969 One July afternoon in 1969, more than seven months after Jody's visit, The Eastern Sea Coast Birds by Catherine Danielle Clark, her second book, a volume of stark detail and beauty, appeared in her mailbox. She ran her fingers over the striking jacket, her painting of a heron gull. Smiling, she said, Hey, Big Red, you made it to the cover. Carrying the new book, Kaya walked silently down to the shady oak clearing near her shack, searching for mushrooms. The moist duff felt cool on her feet as she neared a cluster of intensely yellow toadstools. Mid-stride, she halted. There, sitting on the old feather stump, was a small milk carton, red and white, just like the one from so long ago. Unexpectedly, she let out a laugh. Inside the carton, wrapped in tissue paper, was an old army-issue compass in a brass case, tarnished green-grey with age. She breathed in at the sight of it. She had never needed a compass because the directions seemed so obvious to her, but on cloudy days when the sun was elusive, the compass would guide her. A folded note read, Dearest Kaya, this compass was my grandpa's, from the First World War. He gave it to me when I was little, but I've never used it, and I thought maybe you would get the best out of it. Love, Tate. P.S. I'm glad you can read this note. Kaya read the words, dearest and love again. Tate, the golden-haired boy in the boat, guiding her home before a storm, gifting her feathers on a weathered stump, teaching her to read, the tender teenager staring her steering her through her first cycle as a woman and arousing her first sexual desires as a female, the young scientist encouraging her to publish books. Despite gifting him, gifting him the shell book, she had continued to hide in the undergrowth when she saw him in the marsh, rowing away unseen. The dishonest signals of fireflies, all she knew of love. Even Jody had said that she should give Tate another chance. But every time she thought of him or saw him, her heart jumped from the old love to the pain of abandonment. She wished it would settle on one side or the other. Several mornings later, she slipped through the estuaries in an early fog the compass tucked in her knapsack, though she would not likely need it. She planned to search for rare wildflowers on a, wooden, on a wooded tongue of sand just jut, that jutted into the sea, but part of her scanned the waterways for Tate's boat. The fog turned stubborn and lingered, twisting in the tendrils around the tree snags and low-lying low limbs. The area was still. 
Even the birds were quiet as she eased through the channel. Nearby, a clonk-clonk sounded as a slow-moving oar tapped a gunwale, and then a boat emerged ghoul-like from the haze. Colours, which had been muted by the dimness, formed into shapes as they moved into the light. Golden hair beneath a red cap, as if coming, for, coming in from a dream. Tate stood in the stern of his old fishing boat, poling through the channel. Kaya cut her engine and rode backward into a thicket to watch him pass. Always backward to watch him pass. At sundown, karma, heart back in place, Kaya stood on the beach and recited. Sunsets are never simple. Twilight is refracted and reflected, but never true. Even tide is a disguise, covering tracks, covering lies. We don't care that dusk deceives. We see brilliant colours and never learn. The sun has dropped beneath the earth by the time we see the burn. Sunsets are in disguise, covering truths, covering lies.